talking today about um, congestive heart failure. Uh, it's Emma Fenske, I go to Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine um, in New Mexico. Um, but um, this is an advanced topic. So we are going to um, kind of, you know, break it down pretty easily. Um, as always, don't, um, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat. You can unmute yourself, whatever you guys see fit. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I'm really gonna try to break it down to your guys' level. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, other than this, I am getting over an illness. So if I um, cough a little bit, I apologize in advance, um, but um, let's get started here. All right, so um, before I tell you about this recommended read, are you guys reading or at least Googling the things that I'm uh, putting up here for these recommended reads? So I think I one yes here, perfect, good. So um, this is a, a, a good book, it's called In Stitches. Um, it was published a while ago and uh, it's actually pretty, he has a very good sense of humor. I recommend this one, it's a very lighthearted, easy read. Um, and I, I see that there's quite a few people with us today. Um, it must be application season. You guys are, are, are trying to get your hours in, um, but, um, I recommend this book. Um, it, it's a good little memoir about his, his journey in medicine. So check this one out. Um, and if you want the other recommendations, we do have a um, page in our resources that has a few of those listed as well. And you can always go back and watch the old videos that, that have the, um, the uh, recommendations as well. Okay, so um, as I kind of indicated to you before, um, we're talking today about, um, about CHF. Um, like most things in medicine, um, you know, some, some things just aren't funny, but um, I like this. I'm a dog person. Um, and if, if you're not aware, Lasix is a, um, a diuretic, kind of takes the water off of you. So I thought this was funny. I loved it. <clears throat> um, and I have a poll for you here, um, like the last few times. So let me launch this for you. Um, so take a few seconds. Um, I want, you know, almost everybody to, to answer this. I'll give you about a minute. Um, be honest and kind of give your, um, your opinion of, of what you know about CHF. Okay, so uh, it looks like most of you guys are, are in there. I think 43 out of 46 people answered. Um, so the majority of you, 62% of you said that you know a little bit, and that's completely okay. Um, and that's what I usually expect at the beginning. Um, I, my goal for you guys is that everybody is kind of threes in and higher after the end of the, the presentation. Um, and if some things just don't stick with you with this presentation, that's okay too. You know, I was always the person that I never got a lot from the first lecture. Um, and then sometimes it takes a little bit of, you know, um, repetition to learn some stuff. So don't be overwhelmed if some of this stuff is, is heavy or difficult to learn. A lot of stuff the first time is, okay? So um, let's go on here. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're at, like the last few se sessions um, for our virtual rounds, we're gonna talk about a case. Um, we're going to do, uh, we're going to go through the physical exam. Um, we will talk about the differential diagnoses, and then we will uh, talk about the assessment of plan, and then we'll go through a lesson on the pathology of the disease. Um, as always, your guys' role is to actively participate, and then also fill out that SOAP note. If you want to kind of have credit and have that certificate for this session, uh, fill out that SOAP note. Fill out the quiz um, at the um, end of the presentation. I promise you it shouldn't be too challenging. In fact, um, I like to make it simple and I like to reward you guys um, for, for coming to the session, paying attention. Um, you should be able to get in your first try. That's my goal for you. Um, and then please, please give us any feedback that, um, that you can at the end of the session. 
Okay, here's the soap note. Um, for those of you that are brand new tonight, um, don't feel overwhelmed. Um, here's the form. Becca put the link in the uh, chat box. And then what you're going to do is just uh, fill this out to the best of your ability. We don't grade it. We don't, you know, follow up on you and say, you know, this is great. This is horrible. We don't do that at all. This is purely for your practice. Um, in the subjective, put anything that the patient tells you. In the objective, put anything that we produce, you know, vital signs, physical exam, um, and then the A is for assessment. So you're gonna put your differential diagnoses there. And then P is plan. That's where we're gonna put all of our treatments. All of that information should be abundantly clear to you during this presentation. And if you have any questions about anything, uh, feel free to, to put it in the chat or um, unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your question. All right, and this is, is uh, a, a poll question that I have for you guys, just real quick, uh, before we kind of go into our, um, into our lesson. Um, just because just I'm curious, and I'm sure you guys are curious too. Let me launch this one. Um, we, have nearly, we, we have nearly 50 people, we have 49 people. So um, let me know, have you guys gotten COVID? I know most of you are probably fairly young. All right, let me share this for you and we can move on here. So surprisingly, I was thinking every, most everyone would say yes, um, you know, given how long the pandemic has been going on and given the kind of far reaching effects. Um, but really 80% of you guys said no and 20% of you said yes. So I hope those of you that have said yes or are well and don't have, you know, lasting, lasting effects from COVID, I know it's very far reaching and is very serious. Um, and I'm sure that the people of whom have had COVID know kind of the, the seriousness of it. So I'm glad you guys are all here um, at, our, at our session um, and made it through COVID. All right, so um, let's keep it moving here. Um, and here um, is, let me uh, move that, that X there. Okay, so here is our um, case. So a 66-year-old man with a past medical history significant for hypertension um, presents for a four-day history of shortness of breath. He notes that he's been short of breath when walking and attempting to dress himself in the mornings. Um, also, he has noticed his feet have been more swollen despite limiting fluids and elevating his feet for five hours after work each day. Uh, the patient also describes fatigue and mild weight gain, but denies chest pain, dizziness, or syncope. Syncope means to pass out. And um, his spouse is present for the interview and states that the patient has been snoring at night and uh, sleeping on the living room recliner since he is severely short of breath when he is lying flat. At night, he sometimes awakens and feels the need to step outside for fresh air due to his shortness of breath. He takes amlodipine for his hypertension um, and denies any other medication, alcohol, or drug use. So uh, pay attention to those bolded things. They're, they're kind of there for a reason. All right, so first question for you guys that I really want you to consider here. Um, what important differential diagnoses are we going to, you know, what should be popping out in our heads uh, given the symptoms or the story that, that we have got thus far. What ideas do you guys have? COPD. I think that's certainly a consideration with um, his history of shortness of breath, absolutely. So we're thinking more along pul pulmonary lines, sure, asthma. Pulmonary, pulmonary edema causing shortness of breath, absolutely. So pulmonary edema, we're thinking, you know, maybe, you know, a little bit cardiac, maybe a little bit pulmonary, good. What else, guys? Try to give me two more, let's think of two more and then we'll go on to the next question. 
Good. Yeah, we can think of, you know, um, like a infection of the pleura and anything like that. Sure. Lung infection. We could also think of pneumonia. Um, pulmonary embolism. Good. Yeah, these are all good differentials when we think of um, when we think of shortness of breath. Kidney issues le leading to, to lower extremity swelling? Absolutely, that's something we can certainly consider. The thing is, we don't know a lot right now, but when you think of your differential diagnosis, you want to make it broad so that you don't miss anything and you kind of um, sort of narrow in on the correct thing. Um, the swelling would make you think of cardiac in nature. It certainly can, though, um, as you will, will come to realize, there's a lot of things that can really cause swelling. Um, one of which is in his history. Do you guys, did, did anybody pick up on that? Um, he's on one medication that causes swelling. Does anybody know this or remember what it was from the amlodipine? Yeah, good job. Calcium channel blockers, uh, which is the class of amlodipine, is no lower extremity edema. That's why I put it in, um, in bold in the vignette. So that's what we want to kind of keep in mind. Swelling because of a drug reaction, swelling because of injury. There's lots of things that can cause swelling, okay? All right, so next question I have for you guys. Um, what details are of the utmost, what should we be kind of honing in on that this guy or this, um, this man and his spouse have, have told us thus far? <coughs> Shortness of breath, good. What else? How fast the symptoms appeared? Yeah, good. He, he said that this has been going on for four days. Snoring, yeah, since his uh, spouse started. It's always going to be the spouse that tells you about the snoring. The patient will never know. Fatigue, swelling, um, and his hypertension history. Good job, Megan. That's absolutely important, his history of hypertension. Good. Cardiac pro problems since he's taking amlodipine. Yeah, exactly. He has hypertension. So is his hypertension causing, you know, a, a secondary abnormality? Good job. Going off for fresh air. Good job. Do you know what, does anybody know what that's called? I'm glad you guys picked up on that. If you don't know, it's okay. It's a, it's a, um, it's like a $10 word. It's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Um, for short, it's called PND. Okay. Um, and, and you'll see it on a slide here in the future. So you don't have to remember that. Um, yeah, exactly. What a word. Seriously, it's, it's very complicated. Um, and then one more thing, where is he sleeping at night? He's not sleeping in the bed. Where's this man sleeping? He's sleeping in his recliner. Yes. And you're always going to hear that, or you're going to hear that the patient is using like 17 pillows to prop themselves up at night, which you and I both know that's not comfortable, but to people who have fluid on their lungs or are fluid overloaded, it's absolutely comfortable for them. So does anybody know what that one is called? That um, sort of finding when they have to use pillows to prop them up or they're sleeping in the recliner. Orthopnea, good job guys, great job. It's called orthopnea. And then um, surprisingly when people, you know, if this man came in and said, I'm using um, four pillows to sleep at night, I would, you know, chart that as uh, four pillow orthopnea just to show you know, that this person needs to you know, use pillows to prop them up at night, all right? So uh, next question for you all. Um, what question should we ask this, this family before we, we proceed? Yeah, good job, Rachel. Absolutely. Has this ever happened before? Good. I always ask that, even if they come in, you know, with a, a um, upper respiratory infection. I always ask because it's an easy way to know, um, you know, and point the, in the right direction. Um, family history. Good. Um, any change in medication dose? Absolutely. Are the symptoms worsening? Good. Any other medical history? Good job. Ask about weight loss. You guys are all on the right track. Good job. So my next question for you is, um, what body areas do we want to examine? And what, ask what makes the symptoms better or worse. Good job. I see we have some scribes here. 
yeah, we want to examine the legs and see if there's edema. We want to look at the lungs. We want to listen to them. We want to um, look at the heart. Good legs, upper abdomen. Good job. Why upper abdomen, Trish? Because of swelling. I thought you were going to get exactly to it. We're going to get to why upper abdomen, but um, and, and it'll be abundantly point. Right upper quadrant, good, yeah. So you, you know exactly why. We wanna look at the liver. Good job, great job. All right, so let's go on here. You guys said that <coughs> we wanted to look at the legs. So what do we see in this image here? I'm, I'm showing you the patient this time first and should have, instead of just telling you the, um, good, instead of just telling you the, the physical exam findings. Um, so we see pitting edema. And we call it pitting edema because when you press your finger in, it feels like dough. Um, and it, I know that sounds dramatic, but it really does. And when you feel pitting edema, you'll know what it is. Um, this patient has you know, very drastic pitting edema and we grade it from one plus to four plus. I would call this probably four plus, you know, if not three plus. And then um, someone beat me, the image on the right is increased JVP. And what is a, do you guys know what increased JVP is a sign of? Close. Um, it, it, it's usually a sign of fluid overload, increased pressures, um, and, and sometimes decreased cardiac output. So that, that's a tough one. And that gets more into like the physiology of the heart, which can, you know, be a whole lesson in and of itself. So good job with this one, guys. Let's go into the physical exam here. We see really that the, the patient is, um, let me get my pointer out here. We see that the, the patient is, um, oops. I had it just a second ago. All right, we see that the patient is tachycardic. Um, we also see that um, uh, the patient's hypotensive and, and breathing a little bit fast. Um, other than that, we see that the patient is lethargic, um, that his, um, his H-E-E-N-T -E -E exam is normal. Um, he is tachycardic. Obviously, we saw that on the, the um, vitals, but he has an S3 gallop, so we want to kind of keep that in the back of our minds. Um, and he does have an elevated JVP. We saw that on our own physical exam before. We, we beat this examiner to the punch. Um, and we see diffuse crackles in the bilateral lower lobes with wheezes. So we know maybe there's some fluid on the lungs by the, the sort of present, the, the sound of these crackles. Um, and, and for those of you that, that haven't heard crackles, which I imagine that most of you haven't, it almost sounds like um, like Rice Krispies. Um, when you pour the milk in it, it just sounds like fine crackles. Um, and then in the abdominal exam, it's a little bit distended. Um, and he has a, <coughs> excuse me, he has a little bit of tenderness to palpation um, to the right upper quadrant. Um, he has hepatomegaly, but no splenomegaly. Um, other than this, he has, um, he has uh, three plus pitting edema um, to the bilateral lower extremities um, to the mid shin. So for basically for the um, S3 gallop, who has ideas for um, what the S3 gallop means? It's a hard question, I know, and it's a loaded question. So Rachel, you're, you're kind of close. It, it means it's an extra beat. So um, basically um, what we usually see, and let me draw this out for you because everything's easier with a diagram. What we usually see here is, is S1, that's a horrible S, and S2. And then, um, what we what we see with this patient is an extra um, heart sound, and that's what we're calling an S3. An S3 is usually a um, sign of volume overload, having increased fluid. If we hear an S4, um, then which an S4 would be over here, 
An S4 is usually a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy, so enlarged left ventricle. Okay, so that's a hard question. I didn't expect you guys to know that. Um, this patient has uh, also three plus pitting edema. So we, we're getting this impression that this patient is, is volume overloaded. But where is this coming from is, is our question now, or should be our question right now. Okay, so let's go on here. Oh, and, and here to the left is, is kind of this um, diagram, um, a complex diagram. Uh, I'm sure it's your guys' favorite. Uh, for how to, to measure JVP. And basically we, um, what we do is we find the maneuverum or the um, external angle and we uh, measure upwards and then um, up over to the, where we can see the, the, um, the pulsation. And, and so it's the, the JVP plus five centimeters is, is the calculation of the, the JVP. Not that you guys need that, but you will, you will one day. And so that's just kind of the, of where kind of the, the uh, calculation of the, the central venous, the CVP, okay. And then when we say the, the, um, the CVP is elevated, that's greater than three centimeters. All right. So here's our lab values. Um, and what we're seeing here is a few things we're seeing, um, and, and you can see kind of the, the key in the upper right-hand corner. Some of these fishbone diagrams are hard to kind of discern if you're not used to it. So um, don't feel overwhelmed. The key is there for you to help you. Um, we see that the, the patient is hypone or hyponatremic, hypokalemic, so low sodium, low potassium. We also see that the uh, patient has a um, low CO2. Um, some smart student out there, tell me, why is the CO2 low? This is what we're looking at now. This is more of a physiology question too. Blood bicarbonate thing. Yeah, sort of. He's breathing fast. Good job, Brandon. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. He is tachypnic. His rate was 21. So he's breathing a little bit fast and he's short of breath. So he's probably taking um, low breaths um, to try to compensate for his shortness of breath. And therefore, if he's breathing fast, he's blowing off more CO2. So his CO2 will be low. Okay. So hyperventilation, exactly, Zena. It is hyperventilation. So he's taking fast, short breaths, which is exactly hyperventilation. So, um, then his uh, BUN is high and his creatinine is high. So we know something's going on with the kidneys, but we don't know just yet right now. And then over to the left over here, we see that his BNP is high and also his GFR is low. So what does BNP tell us? Does anybody know? That's okay if nobody knows. BNP um, is what we use um, as kind of a marker. It's called brain natriuretic peptide. That's what BNP stands for. We use it kind of a marker for heart failure. It is released by the ventricles. Um, and, and we know that when it's elevated that this is kind of pointing us in the direction of heart failure. This patient's BNP is elevated. Um, and his GFR is low. Um, we know that here, the, the patient um, is, is in kind of chronic kidney disease range. Um, so my question for you guys, um, and, and we see over here that his, his CBC is um, you know, fairly normal. His, um, his hemoglobin is like, oh, is borderline low. His hematocrit is, is okay. His white blood cell count's okay and his platelets are okay. So we're not too worried about that. Um, we don't have any other lab values, but my question, the big kind of million dollar question for you all is what additional testing or imaging do we need at this point? What do we wanna know? What do we wanna look at? You are sitting at the computer and you're in your order. What do you order?
Good. You guys are, are, are right on track. All of those answers are the three things that I have coming up. So great job. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of smart people out there today. So chest x-ray, absolutely. We're absolutely going to look at a chest x-ray today. We're going to look at an echocardiogram of the heart, um, which is basically an ultrasound of the heart. And then we are going to um, look at a, um, an electrocardiogram. So we're going to look at the electrical activity of the heart. So perfect. So let's start with the EKG. It's quick, it's easy to do. Um, do we have any um, EMTs out there or anybody that can read an, an uh, EKG and want to give a, a wild guess of, of what we're looking at here? I can see why you think atrial fibrillation, but I think that's just like an undulating baseline. So that, it, it's a great guess. When in doubt, say AFib. What I'm pointing you guys to here and kind of goes along with this patient's history um, is, so what we look at is the, um, the P waves. So let me show you a good one here. So here's a P wave here. And then here's a Q, R, S, and then T waves are over here. So what we're, we're, we're kind of taking a picture at all, taking a look at all of those. And what we're seeing here, when we look at V1, lead V1, lead V2, lead V3, is we're seeing these deep QRS complexes. We see that they're coming really deeply down. You see how long these ones are? And that's not good. And, and what we, um, what we look at or what we, we kind of think of when we see those deep Q waves um, is left ventricular hypertrophy. So kind of this, this beefy left um, ventricle. And, and what from this patient's history points us in the direction of left ventricular hypertrophy? Hypertension, good job, Rachel, absolutely. So when we are, when the heart is exposed to increased pressures, it's going to sort of bulk up in order to compensate for those, those increased pressures. You know, the same way you go to the gym and you pick up, you know, a, a 20 pound weight, if you do that on, you know, day five or day one, it's gonna be difficult at least it will for me. And then if you go and do it, you know, every day for 365 days, your muscle is going to compensate to do that. Um, and, and that's exactly how the heart is too. It's a muscle. It's going to compensate to deal with the pressure and the, the, um, the work that it has to do to pump that um, increased pressure outside. So good job. You guys are, are right along that. Um, so I, I, I see now there's a lot of physiology here and I hope you guys aren't too overwhelmed at this point. Um, okay, so we're looking at a chest x-ray. You guys ordered a chest x-ray. So what do we see? Does anybody have any idea here what we're looking at? So we got a, um, we got a PA and a lateral film. Fluid, you're close, you're close Megan. There, there is you know, increased fluid there. Enlarged heart. Good job, Zane. Absolutely. We do see some cardiomegaly. Good job, Brandon. Brandon said it as well. Perfect. We do see cardiomegaly. Large left ventricle. Absolutely. We do see that. I see budding, um, budding radiologists out there. Pulmonary congestion. Good job. Absolutely. We do see some pulmonary congestion. Just as, a, as an orientation point, does anybody know what this is right here? Large mediastinum, good job. Yeah, good job, is that the aortic knob? Yeah, that's the aorta, good job guys. You guys pay attention in your anatomy courses, great job. Good, so let's talk a little bit about this x-ray. So let me go on to the next slide here. Um, so I'm gonna show you a few things. There's lots of things in this. Um, in this uh, 
you know, chest X-ray. So what we see here is cephalization of the, the pulmonary veins. And, and what that means is kind of the pulmonary veins are, are coming anterior. And, and we kind of see them here and here. Um, we also see um, hazy contour of the vessels, which can be the result of, of pulmonary congestion. Um, we also see um, curly B lines, um, which isn't um, Cardi B, so don't get that confused. It's not Cardi B lines, it's curly B, but I can think Cardi B every time I hear curly B lines. Um, just know that I, I think curly B lines were, long, were there long before Cardi B was famous, so just remember it that way. But uh, curly B lines are kind of these linear lines that are indicative of, of fluid overload, okay? Um, and uh, we do see cardiomegaly. Um, and what we really um, are looking at here is, yes, big, but there's a widened medius. We see a big mediastinum. He said that as well. So, and then um, what, what question I for you, and wish that I could kind of zoom this in so you guys could see it, but if you guys are curious, Google it on, um, on um, or Google, Google image search it and look for um, curly B lines, not Cardi B lines, and it'll show you some image and you'll see these kind of linear, um, linear uh, contour of the, the um, image, and that's the curly B lines. And you know, if I when I zoomed into this image, I could see them really well. But during in Google Slides, I, I don't have that capability. So um, go in and, and Google this and kind of play around with those images because with your own computer, you can zoom in pretty well. But um, what is the next test that we should obtain here? You guys did say it before. Yeah, exactly. You got it. So let's look at an echo. All right. So uh, we <coughs> we saw our um, our EKG, um, and we know that our friend the left ventricle um, is is has the team on his back, and he's doing the work for for you know the whole heart here. Um, and so similarly, we see here that the, the left ventricle is working hard. We see this increased contour of this muscle here. You know, if we look at, you know, the right ventricle over here, um, I'm not sure why it's not labeled, I guess, because you can do the math. Um, if there's three here, the other one left has to be the right, right ventricle. But what, what we see here in comparison to this one is this is a big beefy muscle. And the left ventricle should be more muscular than the right ventricle, but not this muscular, or this, uh, you know, not this big as a muscle. Um, so this is concerning for left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and then, you know, obviously we're looking at lots of other parameters with the echo, we're you know, at the valve, the valves closing on each other. We're looking at lots of different things. But the important thing that we're looking at today with this patient is the ejection fraction. A normal ejection fraction is, you know, anywhere from uh, 50 to 70. Um, we see with this patient that um, his ejection fraction is 44, which is problematic because if the heart's not pumping, you know, as it should, then fluid can back up in the heart and then go to the periphery, which may be why we're seeing this swelling. Okay. So. We're, we're at kind of, you know, our, our differentials. We have to make up our mind here. We got our tests, we got our labs. What's on our no, number one differential? <coughs> you guys aren't ready to put your money in on anything? Okay, you guys are just slow typers. Good job, yeah, heart failure, absolutely right. The, the echo really gave that away to us. It told us the ejection fraction was low. This patient is in heart failure. Do you know what his heart failure is likely secondary to?
take one more step backwards, not necessarily the left ventricular hypertrophy, but we can, yeah, to the hypertension. Good job, Rachel. Good, yeah. So the hypertension caused the left ventricular hypertrophy, which may have inadvertently caused the heart failure. You know, this is like the egg game, which, which came first. But um, I was just about to talk about Matthew, thanks for asking. Um, we are calling this heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So it, unless there was um, an abbreviation for abbreviation. So this, um, this is heart failure. And then the little r is reduced ejection fraction. And we're going to talk about all these classifications here in a minute. But we know that because his ejection fraction is 44%, we call this a reduced ejection fraction. The alternative is with preserved ejection fraction. Okay. And so um, we know that since his heart failure is, um, or his ejection fraction is low, we can't call it preserved. Okay. Um, so name three findings here that led us to this diagnosis um, of congestive heart failure. <clears throat> the normal ejection fraction is uh, 50 to 70. And it, it depends on, you know, your kind of physiology. If you're a, a very trained, you know, Olympic athlete, your ejection fraction can be a lot higher than, you know, what's average. So three findings that led us to this diagnosis. The echo, good. Yeah, edema, longstanding hypertension, shortness of breath, elevated JVP. Yeah, you guys are all on, on track. What about the lab finding? Good job. Elevated BNP. You guys are right on it. Um, Yard got it. Perfect. So we got the elevated BNP, um, the chest X-ray and echo findings, and um, the clinical presentation. So those kind of three in combination point us in the direction we say, okay, this person has heart failure. Now, how are we going to treat them? But it wouldn't be um, complete if we didn't have a, a differential. Um, so we can throw in acute kidney injury. It's less likely. We can throw in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, but th that's less likely as well. So um, next question, how are we gonna treat this patient? What should we do for this person? Think um, dog meme at the beginning. What should we give this patient? Lasix, yeah, diuretics, perfect. You guys are, you guys are paying attention. Um, and there's an acronym for this. And what we, um, what we say, is L-M-N-O-P. Um, and if you guys recall, that is the alphabet, so it's fairly easy to remember. And if you're mnemonics people, um, that would work perfectly for you. We're gonna admit this patient to the CCU or ICU. They need to be admitted and monitored, um, at least um, in uh, telemetry where we can watch their, um, their heart. Um, but let's talk about L-M-N-O-P. So the L means Lasix. So that's furosemide is the generic. And then the, um, and, and the, the Lasix um, it is basically, it's a diuretic. So it's gonna cause the kidney to, to diurese and the patient to pee off the fluid. Um, the M is for morphine. We think morphine, okay, it's for pain. He's not in pain, why are we giving this? But it's a venodilator and it's gonna decrease the afterload of the heart. And when we say afterload, what we mean is the resistance that the heart has to pump against. Okay, so it's gonna drop that. And so the, the heart is gonna be able to pump easier. It's gonna dilate those vessels and, and allow us to, to pump blood easier. So that's why we give morphine, it helps. Um, the other thing is nitrates. Nitrates are also a venodilator as well. Um, hence why we also give them um, in a myocardial infarction. And, and then we want, want to give oxygen. This patient's short of breath. Um, I don't remember what his O2 sat was, um, but I imagine it was low. Um, but uh, at any rate, this patient's short of breath. Give him oxygen. Um, and then the P is for position. Um, what we want to do is elevate the upper body 
um, which is going to um, decrease the preload and increase the return to the heart. Um, and, and most of the time, the patient's going to do this for you anyway. Um, they're they're going to want to set up. That's where they're most comfortable. Um, same thing with um, COP, a COPD exacerbation. Um, in COPD, they also um, sit up and lean forward in what we call a tripoding position. With um, heart failure, they're going to want to sit up anyway. The same way they don't like to lay, lay flat, they're going to want to sit up here as well. Other than this, what we want to do is begin uh, dobutamine. Um, and this is a, a drug that's an um, ionotrope. It, it increases the heart contractility. It's also a vasodilator. Um, and because the ejection fraction is low, we want to increase the contractility. Um, so we have a question. Was the fact that the patient said they were elevating their legs in the vignette significant to the diagnosis? It could have certainly been. Um, you know, it's hard to tell um, if they were, you know, if one thing caused the other. It, you know, in, in that case, it could have certainly not been helping, right? Because we, we want to increase the return to the heart. Um, but um, it, it's, it's really hard to tell, right? Okay, and then we want to manage the BP meds. So if you guys remember, his, his systolic blood pressure was 88. So um, we want to manage his BP meds. We want to hold his amlodipine. And then the other thing um, is when his blood pressure normalizes, we want to start a beta blocker and we want to start a, an ACE inhibitor. So when you uh, guys think beta blockers, those end in OLAL. Um, and then the uh, ACE inhibitors end in PRIL, okay? And um, those are good for um, heart failure. They're, they're kind of cardioprotective in that um, regard. So we want to start those medications. And then other than this, we want to limit fluid intake and we want to limit salt intake. When we think of intake, we think of... Um, if you guys want to do a home experiment, go and eat um, some of those really like salty Lay's chips, the ones that they claim you can only, you, you can't just eat one. Eat like a bag of those and then, um, and then take your weight, you know, an hour later and uh, tell me that you don't weigh more than you did before. It's because your body's going to retain all that, you know, or just judge it by the fact that, you know, you're not going to be diuresing. You're not going to have to pee in the next few hours because your body's holding back all that water, all that fluid that you drank in order to um, sort of balance out that, that fluid homeostasis, okay? So in this instance, we don't want him to accumulate any more fluids. So we, want to we want to limit his salt intake. Similarly, um, we want to limit his fluid. Um, I heard eat a whole bag of chips. Yeah, there you go. You guys have permission, I guess. Um, maybe like one of those little snack size ones. I, I take it back. Don't eat a whole bag. All right. And then, yeah, we're trying to prevent fluid overload with that. All right. So let's talk pathology now. So there's lots of ways to, to talk about this. Um, I kind of alluded to it, um, you know, before, but um, basically what heart failure is, is a failure, failure of the heart to pump, pump blood to meet metabolic demand. The two ways that we really talk about it, and really the two most popular ways, and the most popular way is this one at the top, and that's why I talk about it. We're not really going to talk about, you know, really these ones, but I do mention them because they're good ways to think about it, and it makes you think about the physiology as well. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that's this one with the little r. As we alluded to before, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that's this one. So reduced is um, an ejection fraction technically less than 55. Um, and then preserved is um, a normal ejection fraction, but they're in heart failure. Um, and then the um, other ways we can think of it is systolic versus diastolic. Systolic means impaired pumping of the heart, and diastolic means impaired relax relaxation of the heart. So stiff ventricles um, that don't allow relaxation. <laughs> then other ways we can think about it is back. So there's increased filling pressures. There's lots of congestion or forward. So there's impaired uh, like perfusion. And as you guys are probably thinking right now, you're probably thinking in your head, these are all the same ways to say the same things. 
And you would be absolutely right. They are. Um, and then, you know, just to, to kind of, um, you know, beat a dead horse at this point, um, there's low output versus high output, and then left-sided versus right-sided. Really, I think the only one that's different here is the left-sided versus right-sided. And this kind of manifests more symptomatically. When we think of left-sided heart failure, we're, we're thinking of the, the left side of the heart. Um, and, and we're thinking more um, pulmonary edema because we know that the left side of the heart hooks up to the, the pulmonary vessels. Right side, we know that that hooks up to the, um, to the vena cava and we see uh, peripheral uh, manifestations like elevated JVP, we see hepatomegaly, we see splenomegaly and we see edema. So, oh, you beat me to it. Um, so we had a question out there that said the patient had both left and right-sided heart failure. Absolutely right. Um, so you would be right by saying that, and that was going to be my question for you. So what does this patient have? Um, and, and that's absolutely right. The, the patient had, you know, a mixture of both left-sided and right-sided heart failure. And so, you know, a lot of times with heart failure, you see kind of this mixed picture. And that's why, you know, this kind of classification can be easier to, to classify, classify it because, you know, we're, it, it's a little more concrete where here it's like, okay, the patient has both of these. All right. So I hope that makes a little more sense um, there um, in terms of classifying it. And then another way we can go about it is this way of classifying it based on symptoms. Um, you know, every, you know, few years, uh, you know, the uh, American Heart Association, the New York Heart um, Association will kind of go back and forth. Same thing with hypertension. Um, and, and, you know, everybody will want to come out with these guidelines about how to, um, you know, classify different things. Um, this one is used less, um, but it still exists. This is kind of the one that the New York Heart Association. So class one, we say the patient is in heart failure, but they're asymptomatic, okay? Uh, class two, the um, patient is symptomatic with moderate exertion. Um, so maybe, you know, when they uh, walk in the park, they're short of breath, or, or they go up the stairs, they're short of breath. So things that, you know, they're exerting themselves. And then three, what we expect to see is um, they're symptomatic with minimal exertion. So this is the person that's short of breath when they're combing their hair, or they're getting dressed in the morning, or they're, um, you know, just walking out to the car things that we wouldn't expect them to get short of breath doing, okay? And then um, the class four is symptomatic at rest. So they're just sitting and watching, you know, friends on the television and they're short of breath. They can't enjoy friends because they're short of breath. Okay, so um, all of that being said, do you guys remember what class this patient would be? And there was a question, did the echo show signs of right-sided um, heart failure? Um, it probably technically did. Um, I didn't list any. Um, really, we saw the, the, the when we think of right-sided heart failure, we think of more sort of systemic um, effects in terms of um, the elevated JVP, the hepatomegaly, the edema. That's when we think right-sided heart failure. Um, though we, we, we could see evidence of that on the echo. So uh, I see a three, a, a few um, fours and a three. I would call this um, class four. So good job, Matthew. You're absolutely right. The people who said four, tell me why. Why did you say four? He can't sleep in his own bed. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's something that could point to it too. The the reality of it is, <laughs> you guys are probably both right. Um, I would say three because of his concrete evidence um, in terms of him being short of breath in terms of specific activities. Um, yeah, maybe he was short of, short of breath at rest. Um, I based it like Matthew, um, he was short of breath when he was getting dressed in the morning. Is there sort of this ambiguity with it? Yeah, absolutely. Are we all right? Yeah, let's say we're all right and, and move on. 
So good job. I want you guys to think about that. And you'll see in the quiz, there is a question about that. Um, so if you guys need guidance, return to the slide or pull out your phone real quick and, and take a picture of the slide so you can refer to it for the quiz for the, the New York Heart Association. Or you can just Google the New York Heart Association and, and see the guidelines. It's, it's all over. So let's move to the slide. So when we talk about um, risk factors, um, <coughs> we talk about a few. So we can think of congenital heart um, defects, so a vent uh, um, ventricular septal defects, so a hole in the, um, the, between the ventricles. We talk about valvular defects. Um, we can talk about lung disease. Um, we can talk about diabetes, hypertension, cardiomyopathy, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, severe anemia. As I, um, if you guys remember long, long ago, if you listened to me talk about anemia, I told you that a complication of anemia was um, high output heart failure. And so I hope that we're, we're making a connection here. We're connecting a dot and saying, oh, that's what anemia can cause. It can cause this, okay? And that's the nice thing about medicine is it, it kind of connects them. And it's, it, you know, it's amazing when it does that. Um, it can also cause, um, or a, a cause, or, you know, risk factor for it can be arrhythmias, um, hyperthyroidism, um, ischemia, or drugs, um, such as um, trastuzumab, um, a, a drug to treat breast cancer, or doxorubicin, um, a, a treatment for um, bladder cancer and, and some other various cancers. Okay, so um, on physical exam, here is a um, sort of image, um, a drawing. I, I think it, it, it looks like a Netter diagram to me and those are our, always the best um, drawings. Um, so I included it in here. And there's a few things that we you know, saw in this patient. A falling O2 saturation, we saw increased JVP, we saw an S3 gallop. Um, we saw an enlarged liver. Uh, we saw decreased urine output, um, evident by his um, decreased GFR and his um, increased BUN and creatinine. <clears throat> we saw some uh, pitting edema. We saw a little bit of a distended abdomen, maybe some fluid there, maybe ascites. Um, decreased blood pressure. We saw orthopnea. We saw crackles. Um, and we didn't see these ones, or you know, at least it wasn't too evident. But as you can see, we saw a, a very sort of textbook picture from our patient um, of of you know of heart failure. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of patients in heart failure present exactly like this. Um, and it's important to manage them to decrease that fluid off their lungs and help them breathe. Okay. And then in terms of the labs and the imaging, um, we want to look at the, the BNP. Um, we want to um, also look at um, the, we can also see hyponatremia. Um, we can see a um, decreased creatinine um, and um, uh, an elevated, um, this should read elevated um, BUN um, and elevated creatinine. So. Um, for those of you that are visual learners, this should say BUN. BUN and creatinine, and then decreased GFR. This tells us that um, the patient um, is a kidney failure. Then we see hyponatremia because of that fluid overloaded state. Um, so that we would call that a, uh, for all of you that were at the, um, the virtual round, I assume um, that um, brilliant Michaela taught you about um, Volemic hyponatremia. Any bells to anybody that was there last week? Does that sound familiar? Hopefully. Yay. Okay, perfect. It, maybe it's coming full circle again. And that's exactly what, what this guy has. He is hypervolemic, meaning his, his volume is up and he's hyponatremic. So, so there you guys go. There's a plug into last week's um, virtual rounds. Um, and um, in terms of imaging, at exactly how you guys pinpointed, we want to get a chest x-ray, we want to get an EKG, we want to get an echocardiogram. All right, so let's keep it moving. I do have a few questions for you guys coming up, but the complications that we can see, and we talked about this, hepatomegaly, so enlarged liver, 
um, in large spleen, which is splenomegaly, we can see pleural effusion, so increased fluid on the lungs. We can see a left ventricular thrombus, so clot in the left ventricle. We can see cardiogenic shock and hypotension. Um, so a shock that kind of comes from decreased pumping of the, the left ventricle. We can see arrhythmias. Atrial fibrillation is the most common one. We can see kidney failure and we can see death. <clears throat> and I put this chart here to kind of show you um, where our patient is at. And that is, is right here. We see that our patient had a um, BUN of 40. Um, so we know that our patient is in has a, a moderate GFR. So they're in stage 3B kidney failure. Okay. So we see left ventricular thrombus as a complication, mainly because of stasis of blood. Um, so stasis of blood sets us up for a clot. Um, if the heart's not pumping like it should, we see blood that's sitting in where it shouldn't be. It should be moving. Um, so if it's sitting there, it's kind of setting us up for a clot. Okay. Um, so we see a, um, a GFR of 40. We know that this patient is in recovery. All right. So I put this complicated diagram, but we're not going to talk too much about that because um, I, I, I think there's more valuable things for you guys to, to see and questions for you to answer here like this one. So I have a poll for you here. Um, we're going to keep it moving here. And let me launch this for you guys. So I want most of you guys in by one minute. Let me know what this is. So we have most of you guys in, I need 11 more of you. <coughs> All right, you guys are doing very well. A few of you are, um, are sleeping on the job. Uh, no answers from you guys, but um, let me share the results here. 89% um, of you, an overwhelming uh, percentage of you guys said elevated JP, JVP, and you would be absolutely right. 3% um, you know, of you said hepatojugular reflux, um, 3 of you said tension, um, and 3% of you said orthopnea, 3 said S3 gallop. So an S3 gallop can be hear, heard with auscultation. Orthopnea is more of a... Um, you know, if they couldn't breathe and they had to sit up with pillows or sleep in the recliner, hypotension, we, you know, we measure as a, as a vital sign. Hepatojugular reflux, when we think of that, what we think of is when we press on the, the right upper quadrants, we press on the liver, we see an elevated JVP. So I would feel like the next closest answer would be hepatojugular reflux. But um, that's just so you guys know about that. I don't think I've talked a lot about hepatojugular reflux before. But um, let me uh, go on to the next one here. Good job with that one. So um, let me show you this um, video here. And I want to, let's see if I can show you it. Let me launch. I'll do it one more time for those of you that missed it. All right, one last time. All right, a few more seconds for you guys. All right, so 
66% of you guys had the correct answer, which was hepatojugular reflux. Um, and then it seems like 23% of you said elevated JVP. Elevated JVP is kind of part of this, but that's not really what we're seeing here. Um, as the video is kind of showing, as this examiner is demonstrating to you, he's pressing on the right upper quadrant um, and pressing on the liver. And that's caught because of the systemic um, sort of fluid overloaded state, we're seeing an elevated JVP as a result because he's fluid overloaded. Um, and um, other than that, I think the video showed you the title, which a few of you guys didn't catch. I tried everything in my power to hide the title, but I just couldn't. Um, but um, if you guys want to, I, I think this is a great video that shows it. Um, it was the best one I could find for, for sure um, that didn't use like a, a mannequin. And the examiner even had a, a corny joke at the beginning and called it, um, he, he made sure that we knew it was hepatojugular reflux and not reflex. So I, I still remember that. But um, this is hepatojugular reflux. Elevated JVP is part of the story, but that's not what we're seeing here. Okay. Um, all right, one more for you guys. Oops, it wants to show you the video again. All right, so um, let's try something here. See if I can't show you. Are you guys able to hear that? No. Yeah, I didn't think that would work. Okay, well, let's judge it off of, um, let's judge it off of this picture. Um, it looks similar to one of which I have drawn for you in the past. So um, let's go with that. Let me share my screen. I realize I didn't do that for you. All right, there we go. So um, let me uh, launch this poll for you. So what is this finding? Good, you guys are doing great. All right, and for the interest of time, I'm gonna stop it a little bit early. Um, let me share the results here. Um, it is an S3 Gallup. 100% of you guys got this right. I do encourage you to um, look it up on YouTube. Um, this uh, Department of, of Washington had a clip. There's lots of clips out there that, that um, let you um, So I definitely recommend you guys go out there and, and listen to it. I mean, I realize it's after, um, after the time. So if you guys have to leave, um, feel free. Um, we're just finishing up. There's a couple slides left um, that, and then we'll be done. Okay, so let me stop this. Um, so here's kind of those cartoons that I include. You guys can kind of look at this on, on your own time. I think that they, they certainly help. Um, here's the New York Heart Association kind of, you know, um, shows you in cartoon form. And then when we talk about the um, treatment, we kind of see the step up approach to it. Um, we, we see, you know, when there's, um, you know, minimal heart failure, we talk about patient education. Then we talk about you know managing the the um, the comorbidities. We talk about adding ACE, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. We talk about sodium restriction. We talk about you know when it gets kind of um, you know uh, up the up the scale. Then we talk about you know cardiac resynchronization. We talk about um, you know lots of different things um, in, in terms of um, and, and then ionotropes things like that when. The, the patient is in severe heart failure. Um, but this is kind of a step up approach for the patient that we saw, we kind of saw that the, the patient needed, um, you know, diuretics. And then we also saw that the patient needed ionotropes because they were in a C CHF exacerbation. So we saw that our, our patient was kind of up here and, and we would consider them stage D in the American Heart Association. That's what these stages are up here. 
Um, and I, I tried to find a diagram for you that had the New York Heart Association, um, but this was kind of one that I that kind of showed um, the step up approach and literally shows steps. So it's very literal for you. But as you can see, there's kind of the step up approach based on, you know, here's, you know, no symptoms or symptoms all the way up to severe. Okay. And then uh, the, even up here um, is like a ventricular assist device. Um, the thing that um, Izzy cut on, on Denny in uh, Grey's Anatomy, if you guys are Grey's Anatomy fans, um, so that Denny could get the, the heart transplant. Um, I hope someone out there knows what I'm talking about. So it's not just me uh, reminiscing on uh, my Grey's Anatomy days. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, the last thing, unfortunately, is, is hospice. When we, we can't, um, you know, turn around, there's nothing, you know, we can do except for, you know, make the patient comfortable. Um, and then, you know, there's everything in, in, in between. We want to consider a multidisciplinary team when um, the, you know, maybe when the kidneys are involved, like in, in our case today. Okay, so um, I have one last question for you guys, and uh, let me put it up for you here. Um, and a few of you guys said that you, uh, you know what I'm talking about, blessings, great. Let me uh, share this for you, or relaunch it rather. All right, so this is our post poll. Uh, give me an honest answer um, in terms of, of what you learned this evening. I would appreciate your honesty. All right, so most of you guys are um, in. I know it might be past your bedtime. It's certainly past mine. Um, let me share the results here. Um, I appreciate your guys' honesty. I know this was an incredibly difficult um, topic. Um, and uh, it looks like a lot of you guys kind of progress from that I know a little up to some. And the majority of you guys are saying you know some now, which is great. And I appreciate that. Um, and it's always very humbling when you guys can can learn something from me. And that's, you know, my goal for you. So um, that is what I have for you guys. Here are my references. Let me get rid of all my, my chicken scratch here. Um, and, you know, as always, we um, do have these um, weekly. Um, and we will be back uh, next week, next Wednesday. Um, and there was a question just a, for clarification, is it hypotension or hypertension? Um, I need clarification to clarify for you. What do you mean um, was tension or hypertension? Thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate you guys all. It was, um, it was great to spend an hour with you guys. And uh, I'll stick around for, for a few minutes if you guys have any questions at all. I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Question. So in terms of the lifestyle modifications, if the patient's asymptomatic or, you know, uh, New York Heart Association class one or um, American Heart Association class A, um, they can be met, uh, managed without medications, meaning um, low salt diet, um, exercise, um, losing weight, um, limiting fluid and salt intake, a lot of those things manage morbid conditions like their diabetes and hypertension that may have kind of led them to that ejection fraction um, and, and kind of having this cardiac rehab. They certainly can be managed without uh, medications if you know, they're, they're mild, meaning um, you know, maybe they have a preserved ejection fraction and they don't have a lot of symptoms. That's a great question. I have one quick question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Um, so would CHF be like a common comorbidity just because a lot of things can cause it? So do you see this a lot, a lot of times like with your diabetic patients, do they also, will they usually have CHF or like other types of diseases like that? Usually we think of it, uh, that's a great question as well. Usually we think of it like the other way around. So CHF is one of those diagnoses where, you know, it, it's, it's complicated. It's like COPD, um, where you know it's one of these things that you know is is 
um, very detrimental to the body. So what we'll say is, you know, this patient has CHF and the comorbid condition was, you know, their hypertension and their diabetes. And what you're going to find in the hospital is these people are, you know, very sick. And a lot of these comorbid conditions kind of run together. Um, and when you see these people with CHF, they're going to have a lot of comorbid conditions. They're going to have a list, a, a problem list um, in a, in a um, uh, you know, past medical history list that's pretty, you know, complex. They're going to be on a lot of medications. So what we're going to say is, you know, this, this patient has CHF secondary to, you know, their hypertension and their diabetes, probably uncontrolled. Um, and the hypertension and the diabetes would be the comorbid conditions. Does that kind of make a little more sense? Yes, that makes total sense now. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely.